Hello, and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Bob Power, and on behalf of OTC Markets, we're very pleased you've joined us for our next live presentation from Giga Metal. Before I introduce our speaker, a few points to note. Please submit your questions in the question box to the bottom left of the slides. Once the Q&A session has ended, you will automatically be transferred into the Giga Metals booth, where you can continue to ask questions via chat and access additional shareholder materials. On a final note, all of today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24-7 replay. At this point, I'm very pleased to welcome Mark Jarvis, CEO and Director of Giga Metals Corporation, which trades on the OTCQX best market under the symbol HNCKF and on the TSXV under the symbol GIGA. Welcome back, Mark. Well, thanks very much, Bob. I'm very happy to be here. And I just want to thank uh, all of the audience for attending, for your interest. Um, and I'll just get right into it. Here's our standard disclaimer. So who are we? We're a very small company with a very large project. Uh, and it is nickel and cobalt, which are two of the critical materials for lithium ion batteries. Um, and in particular, nickel, uh, nickel is the element that holds the electrons in the cathode. Um, nickel has excellent electron density. And if you want your car to go farther on a single charge, you need more nickel in your cathode. Uh, the other interesting thing about nickel is that um, it, uh, it absorbs and releases energy quite quickly. So when you're driving your electric vehicle uh, and you floor it, uh, nickel is the element that enables you to accelerate very rapidly for you know, those sort of thrills. Um, so when I say it's a large deposit, uh, we um, uh, recently completed an engineering report, uh, a PEA, uh, that models a construction of a mine with a, with a nameplate capacity of 37,000 tons per year of nickel uh, with a 37-year mine life. So truly a giant project. Um, and we'll be talking about this perhaps some more, but we are seeking strategic partners to invest at the project level uh, to help to advance this project because it's a daunting task when a small company has an extremely large project like this. We're in a great mining jurisdiction. Um, uh, Canada and British Columbia are, are uh, this is a jurisdiction where you can get large mines uh, built. Um, but, you know, there are strong ESG practices. Uh, and in particular, the environmental assessment is a rigorous process. Um, the flip side of that is that if you are a buyer of materials from Canadian mines, uh, you can be happy about the ethical implications of buying raw materials from Canada. So it's a low grade project, uh, open pitable, uh, you know, and so it relies on volume uh, for the economics. Um, but this low grade uh, project can make a very high grade concentrate very reliably. It's a simple, simple flow sheet. This is a simple deposit. Uh, 99% of the nickel and cobalt are contained in the mineral pentlandite. So in terms of concentrating the froth flotation, you have to do one thing and one thing only. Float pentlandite and suppress everything else. And that makes for a simple, reliable uh, circuit. Um, plus, this is going to be an extremely low carbon uh, intensity project. And there is even a realistic uh, chance that we could make this, uh, you know, a carbon neutral mine. So again, uh, here's some of the highlights. So 37,000 ton per year nameplate capacity, a very nice high grade concentrate. And uh, we can produce nickel uh, at the site gate uh, over the life of mine uh, at a price of $2.81 a pound nickel. And here's our timeline. Um, so we think we can be ready, uh, shovel ready uh, by 2024. You know, uh, there's always some uncertainty in that. So nothing is written in stone here. 
uh, and, and and we've given ourselves four years between uh, uh, you know being shovel ready, having the feasibility study done, and the environmental assessment done, uh, and startup. And we've given ourselves a couple of years to uh, put the capital together here. Now that could happen more quickly, uh, actually, if we're in a good market. Uh, if we could raise the capital more quickly than within two years, it it will be about a two year um, construction schedule. Uh, and then once it's built, uh, we've got a 37 year mine life. So, so something that will go on and on. Uh, this, uh, concentrate product is, uh, a premium concentrate product and, uh, any smelter would compete to get something of this quality, uh, in the door. Um, so we have modeled in our engineering report that we would sell this concentrate, uh, to the smelters, um, However, we think there are emerging markets that uh, are growing rapidly, whereas the smelter market is not a growing market. It, in fact, it's a shrinking market. Nobody is building new smelters. Every once in a while, a smelter closes. So uh, we know from previous uh, work that we've done is that uh, we can process our concentrate a further step to make something called mixed hydroxide precipitates. And MHP uh, right now is a hot, hot commodity. Uh, this is the form of nickel, the chemical form of nickel that battery makers want. And there's only about 100,000 tons per year of nickel uh, being, being produced in this form right now. There is far more demand than that. And the payabilities are quite high. Um, in fact, the payabilities for both the nickel and the cobalt are more than 90% of the content. That's an important uh, concept. Uh, if you sell to a smelter, well, we modeled payabilities of 78% of the nickel content and only 35% of the cobalt content. So, you know, we think that if we process this one step further, and we're going to be looking at this in the next stage of our engineering, uh, that the extra uh, capital costs and operating costs of, uh, of, of taking our product to an MHP form uh, will uh, be more than paid for by the extra payabilities uh, of the MHP. And then plus you're going to have, uh, we think within five years, you're going to have hundreds of different buyers for MHP. And it's going to be a very liquid and diversified market. Uh, we have modeled uh, the highest standards of tailings management. Um, and, you know, this costs money. But this is, uh, well, for one thing, necessary in Canada. Let's leave it at that. We're in an area of very low seismic rich, risk, which is excellent, uh, and uh, relatively low precipitation in this area. We've got an excellent water balance to this. And another aspect of this is that uh, we're designing our tailings facility so we can maximize the amount of our tailings exposed to the atmosphere, because then they will absorb CO2 from the atmosphere uh, and convert to, from silicate minerals to carbonate minerals. Um, and as they do that, they go through a process of cementation, which adds to the security of an already secure tailings management facility. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, it's a 40 year chart of nickel prices and the black line, uh, the prices have, have been adjusted for inflation to $2020. And you can see that over the 40 years, Nickel is a very volatile uh, commodity, and uh, when it gets in short supply, it can get very, very volatile and spiky. Um, you can also see that we are trading well below uh, the long-term average price. Um, you know, currently nickel uh, is a little bit higher than shown in this chart. It's a little over nine dollars a pound. The long-term average price is eleven dollars a pound. And then we've got this new source of demand, electric vehicles. Uh, traditionally, 70% uh, of nickel has gone into stainless steel, uh, but electric vehicles and the lithium ion batteries for them are the fastest growing uh, source of demand for nickel. And, you know, if you start to figure out, you know, how many electric vehicles are going to be sold over the next few years, um, you know, and by the way, all of the estimates, even the most bullish estimates, 
uh, have failed to capture how quickly this 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 market segment is growing. Um, you know, you're going to need 40 to 70 new large mines by 2040. And by large, I mean, you know, similar size to turn again, call it 35,000 tons per year of nickel, plus or minus. Uh, that's a lot of projects that you need to bring on stream to feed the electric vehicle revolution. Um, and just looking only at North America, uh, at the gigafactories that have been announced and you know there's a couple already or there's one already uh, in production uh, tesla also has a pilot line going uh, in california but all of these new gigafactories that have been announced recently uh, you know i don't know where the nickel is going to come from for them you need depending on the cathode chemistry you're going to need between 150 to 250,000 tons per year of new nickel sourcing just for just for these projects and this is ignoring asia this is ignoring europe uh this is just north america um and so uh well where is this nickel going to come from well here's the current production of nickel and these are some processing facilities um but in terms of projects uh this is this is a list of projects uh in development and the ones in green are the ones that uh, have the intention of creating uh, uh, battery materials. Uh, and the ones in blue uh, are modeled as ferro-nickel, modeled by the companies themselves as a ferro-nickel uh, project. In other words, they're, they're creating nickel in a form that will feed the stainless steel market, but not the battery market. Uh, so of the projects uh, targeted at uh, at the cathode, uh, we are uh, the largest. Uh, so this is uh, this is quite an interesting uh, slide, I think. This is this is an analysis based on our PEA uh, and based on the financial model of our PEA of uh, of the depreciated net present value at a discount rate of eight percent which is a fairly standard metric used in the mining business um, at various nickel prices. And you can see that at the very low end of the range, uh, we have a negative PV8 value. So, so economics are pretty marginal at the low end of the price range. Um, as you get to $10 nickel and $12 nickel, the PV8 value starts to balloon. So at $12 nickel, which is just a dollar over the long-term average price, you're well over a billion dollars US of a PV8 value. And of course, as the nickel price goes higher, this, this, uh, this PV8 value just continues to balloon. Um, so this is the picture to me of leverage. If you are interested uh, in nickel, uh, if you believe that the electric vehicle revolution is gonna continue, and that more and more nickel is going to be needed, uh, well, then, then, then nickel prices uh, will tend to move higher to incentivize the construction of new nickel mines. And uh, if you want to play that thematic, uh, gigametals is an extremely leveraged way to play that. Um, now, our competition worldwide for uh, uh, projects that can supply nickel to to the battery business um, a lot of that competition is a type of deposit uh, called a laterite deposit that's processed using high pressure high temperature acid leach and this is this is the technology that has famously uh, been prone to technical failure there are stories of huge disasters uh, you know in this business because because it's a very complex uh, processing method. Um, however, you know, even the successful HPEL projects do not have particularly strong economics. And in fact, our economics are better than even the, the successful HPEL projects. Um, and uh, there are also uh, environmental downsides to HPEL projects. So out of, you know, out of the 15 or 20 large projects that are known in the world, um, you know, most of them are HPEL projects, 
uh, you know, and a lot of them are in the Coral Triangle uh, region of the Pacific Ocean, places like Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Um, however, HPL projects have been built recently, and it's an interesting question, why? Um, mostly, they've been built by Chinese companies, um, and so it's a case of uh, China Incorporated securing long-term supplies of nickel uh, at a price that they can predict, which is the operating cost of producing the nickel. Um, and so even though these projects will have an internal rate of return of one or two or three percent, uh, which are projects that no Western company would build, uh, uh, the Chinese companies are building them uh, because uh, of the strategic implications of having a long-term supply uh, at what amounts to a fixed price. Um, and so because of that competitive advantage, uh, I think that the Chinese battery companies uh, <laughs> pose, a, pose a, a threat to the Western battery companies. Um, just some of the environmental uh, considerations with uh, laterite deposits. You know, turn again, we're looking at building a hard rock open pit mine. So it's a great big hole in the ground. Um, you know, you cannot extract metals from the earth without having some impact. But uh, in the case of a hard rock mine like this, the impacts are generally limited to your open pit and the tailings facilities um, with some minor, uh, you know, minor impacts elsewhere. Um, whereas with a laterite deposit, with an HPEL project, uh, laterites are strip mines. Uh, they're thin deposits in dirt, and in the Coral Triangle, they're generally uh, underneath uh, complex uh, uh, ecosystems. You know, uh, uh, they're, they're underneath tropical rainforests. And so what you do when you're uh, mining laterite is you are strip mining and tearing down a complex tropical rainforest. You're then processing the earth and the clay uh, very aggressively in high pressure, high temperature, uh, you know, acid leach facilities. And uh, more often than not, you are dumping your tailings uh, directly into the ocean. So, you know, uh, in terms of environmental impacts, uh, an open pit is far, far less impact uh, than a laterite mine. Uh, also, the carbon intensity of sulfide uh, projects is less than uh, laterite uh, projects. And in our case, uh, we would be, in the way we modeled it in our PEA, we would be at the very low end of the emission intensity of probable nickel projects in the world. Um, and what we model in the PEA is, first of all, uh, a carbon intensity of 2.24 to 1. In other words, 2.24 tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of nickel produced. This is assuming that we're using a diesel mining fleet. And we assume that because um, that's what exists right now. Uh, if we could use an electric fleet and plug it into our BC Hydro grid, uh, that carbon intensity would drop to 0.7 to 1. And we think that's the way the market's going we'll be able to access an electric fleet by the time we get this thing built. And then if you uh, uh, add in the sequestration uh, uh, of our tailings, we can get it, we can get our, our, our project to carbon neutral for scope one and two emissions to make uh, a concentrate. Uh, here's our board. Uh, I am the CEO and the chair of the board. Uh, I just want to point out a couple of uh, uh, directors in particular. Martin Vidra, who is our president and a director, uh, he is uh, heading our process of uh, talking to potential strategic investors. And the reason is he knows them uh, very well, um, and they know him. He had a 30-year career at Sherry. He's an engineer, but he also sold nickel and cobalt products to end users. Uh, Bob Morris... A director of our company, uh, uh, his 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 job prior to joining our board, uh, uh, which he retired from about a week before he joined our board, uh, was uh, executive vice president. He was in charge of worldwide sales of uh, base metals for uh, Valley. 
So that included copper, nickel, cobalt, uh, and precious metals. It was a huge portfolio ranging from uh, five to eight billion dollars per year, depending on commodity prices. Uh, he also knows all of the end users and they know him very well. So, so there's some very strong relationships already established. Um, and that, that's why uh, Martin uh, is, 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 is leading our, our discussions. Uh, this is a picture of our share structure. Our market capitalization is, uh, we think, uh, far too cheap. And so why invest in us? Well, it's an extremely large deposit, long life deposit. We can make a high grade concentrate that is amenable to further processing or for sale to a smelter. And you're gonna need a lot of new nickel uh, in the next few years. So thank you very much. I'm gonna move on to uh, some of these questions. Uh, good question of the potential partners you're speaking with. Uh, what are the obstacles? That are keeping them from pulling the trigger and partnering up with you now you know i think the main obstacle frankly is uh uh the size of the companies that we're talking to they're extremely large companies and that's why we're talking to them uh, because they you know they have the financial depth to take on a project of this scale or to help us take on a project of this scale um you know also uh, we're not in production and so you know, the people that need nickel, like particularly the battery companies, they're going to the producers first. Uh, so for example, BASF, the European battery company, uh, did a deal with uh, Nornickel, uh, which is the Russian uh, nickel producer. Uh, uh, BASF is building a gigafactory in Finland, which will be supplied by Nornickel. So obviously you go to the producers first, uh, but I can tell you, uh, BASF has ambitions beyond this one gigafactory and uh, the existing producers don't produce enough. Um, also Panasonic, the uh, Japanese battery manufacturer, uh, announced a deal with uh, BHP uh, to supply nickel uh, sulfate out of Australia to the gigafactory that uh, Panasonic is building as a joint venture with Toyota in um, in uh, Japan. So that again is a good start, but they're going to need more, um, you know, and, and these companies are all looking uh, uh, further down to, to projects that are in development, as well as the projects, obviously, that are already in production. Uh, what is the optimal time for a partner to come on board? That's another question. Um, well, we would like uh, uh, a partner to come on board uh, to an extent, uh, you know, tomorrow. Um, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, however, I can report that there is a great deal of interest. Um, uh, some of the uh, conversations are quite advanced, uh, but we're not, you know, nothing's going to happen tomorrow. However, uh, it, things certainly could happen uh, within the next six to 12 months. Um, a question, can you speak to the plans and opportunity for GIGA's Brazilian copper project? Uh, that copper project uh, is a very uh, interesting uh, project. It's, it's, it's very early stage exploration. Uh, there's a lot of potential in Brazil. Um, and it started with the, with the thought that the São Francisco Basin uh, in Brazil is an offshoot of the copper belt uh, in Africa. Uh, uh, South America and Africa were once part of the same continent. In fact, if you look at a globe, you can see that they would fit together like jigsaw puzzle pieces. Um, and so we found uh, evidence of what's called red bed uh, copper style deposits uh, in the area that we're exploring in. And we're currently drilling, uh, you know, a very initial stage of uh, exploration uh, to confirm or 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 prove wrong our theory that there are red bed copper uh, style deposits uh, in the area that we're exploring uh, if there are it could be extremely uh, interesting but again 
this very early stage, you know, high risk exploration. Um, another uh, interesting question, are there any other nickel projects in Canada that are modeling producing mixed hydroxide precipitates? Uh, the answer is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, Uh, another question, do I think uh, governments are doing enough to solve the upcoming supply chain issues for the battery supply chain in North America? Uh, well, the answer is I don't think so. Um, you know, people talk about, you know, the importance of strategic materials, you know, they study it to death, but uh, governments in general, uh, you know, don't do much about it. And frankly, I don't expect them to do much about it. Um, Another question, what are your key milestones for 2022 and what are the catalysts to increase your valuation versus the peers? Well, you know, we just finished uh, a season of, uh, of drilling and other work at our project to collect data to support our uh, pre-feasibility study. Uh, we didn't get all of the data we need uh, because of, frankly, labor shortages and, uh, you know, COVID restrictions. Uh, we got most of it. We're going to have to go back in uh, probably in June and uh, do not much more work, but we do have more work to do. Um, and so we're hoping to have a pre-feasibility study ready by the end of the year. Uh, that's a key milestone. Uh, but the other milestone that I'm looking for that is less certain is, you know, can we bring a strategic partner on board as an investor at the uh, project level? Uh, if we can do that, that would be a transformative event. Um, another good question here, are the major auto companies planning to use nickel and cobalt like uh, Ford, GM, Toyota, etc.? Yes, that is, that is the primary um, uh, battery type that they're looking at. Uh, although there is also uh, uh, LFP batteries. So so lithium iron phosphate batteries uh, are being used for sort of low end uh, uses where range is not required. So for example, for, for an inexpensive little commuter car, um, you know, LFP is probably a pretty good um, uh, battery type, uh, but you know, really uh, the premium batteries will always involve nickel again, because if you want range, you need nickel. And if you want acceleration, you need nickel. So, uh, you know, they will use both technologies. And I think that's, uh, that's it for the questions that I can see. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for uh, joining the meeting. And we are running out of time. So uh, thank you. And we'll talk to you next time.